Hello students, welcome to the session of Eden Guru. This is Dr. Pankaj Kumar, your biology faculty and in this session we will be talking about some of the abiotic factors. Okay, in case of uh, abiotic factors we will be discussing about air, light, heat, water and soil. So these are the major abiotic factors. One by one we will discuss about that. So first of all let's discuss about the atmosphere. The atmosphere can be divided into the lower that is a troposphere followed by stratosphere followed by mesosphere and finally the uppermost what we call ionosphere. Let's discuss one by one the very nature of all these layers. Let's start with troposphere that is the very basic layer that is the lower portion of the atmosphere. You know this lower portion of the atmosphere extends from 8 to 16 kilometer. So it contains roughly 90 percent of the atmospheric gases. And uh, all the cloud phenomena in terms of thundering, lightning, everything occur in this layer only. So what happens as we go up from ground to upper level, the temperature decreases, okay? And the temperature decreases at the rate of 6.5 degrees Celsius per kilometer. As we move upward by 1 kilometer, the temperature decreases by 6.5. So that is why at high altitude we have a low temperature and at ground we have a high temperature. So the very process in which what happens the decrease of temperature is going to happen with respect to altitude or height we call it is a lapse rate. Okay. Now let's talk about the next layer what we call stratosphere. Now stratosphere extends up to 30 to 50 kilometer. So the layer which separate the stratosphere and uh, troposphere, that layer is actually called as a tropopause. Now, one of the main important event in case of a stratosphere is the presence of the ozone layer. As we move from lower level of stratosphere to higher level, the temperature increases, right? And the temperature increases up to 90 degrees Celsius. So you can understand that in this zone, the temperature is very high. Can anybody of you just tell me why the temperature increases in case of stratosphere? Well, as we move upward, there is increase in the temperature, the reason being the very presence of the UV rays. You know, the concentration of UV rays are very high as we move upward. And this is a UV ray that imparts a greater temperature in the layer of stratosphere. Okay. Now, beyond stratosphere, Let's talk about the mesosphere. The mesosphere extends up to the height of 80 kilometer, okay? But very interestingly, what happens in case of mesosphere, as we move upward in the mesosphere, the temperature again decreases. And in that layer, the temperature can be as low as minus 80 degrees Celsius. Again, the question is why? That why in case of a stratosphere, the temperature is going to increase, but in case of mesosphere, the temperature is going to decrease. Well, for mesosphere, the reason is that in case of mesosphere, there is no gases. So, if there is no gases, even if the sun is striking, in order to have some temperature, there must be some particle, na? The particle is not there, so that's why temperature is not there. Okay, so that is why the temperature decreases in case of the mesosphere. So, we can say that the lack of gases in mesosphere is the reason for the decrease in temperature in case of mesosphere. Right. Finally, the uppermost layer, what we call ionosphere or thermosphere, and that extends up to the height of 300 kilometer from the ground. Okay. And here, what we see, whatever little gases is present over there, the gaseous components are actually getting ionized. So that is why we call them ionosphere. So this was all as far as the atmosphere is concerned. Now let's talk about the gases that is present in case of water. We know very well that oxygen and carbon dioxide and some few other gases are also dissolved in water. Oxygen constituents of water is very essential because the dissolved oxygen provides the oxygen to the aquatic animals. Aquatic animals like fishes depends upon those oxygen only. But as far as the dissolved carbon dioxide is concerned, they play a very, very important role in the carbonic system in the axon of the carbonic system. Now what is carbonic system? Have you ever thought that despite of the fact 
that we humans are creating lot of pollutants in case of river and aquatic system even ganga or yamuna or other river to a large extent still it is a pure given the kind of the pollutants we humans are putting in the river system from the last millions of years so what is the reason the reason primarily lies in the carbonic system now let's learn what is carbonic system water is very very unique in the sense that the water combines with atmospheric co2 and form carbonic acid okay now what happened suppose the pollutants that is being added that is it alkali in nature okay now in order to mitigate the alkaline pollutants the carbonic system is going to add acid over there so how it add acid it actually take atmospheric co2 right and atmospheric co2 binds with the water and as a result carbonic acid is formed right so the moment the alkalines the pollutants that is being added they are taken care by the carbonic acid that is formed you know very well that acid and alkali will get neutralized and eventually the very effect of the alkaline pollutants is going to be negative similarly if the acidic pollution is going to be added what will happen water will combine with the atmospheric co2 carbonic acid is going to be formed but under high alkaline condition what happens that there are two forms of alkali is formed that is calcium carbonate and calcium bicarbonate you know the calcium carbonate and calcium bicarbonate is going to impart the alkaline nature to the water what will happen that the alkali nature will mitigate whatever the acidic pollutants is being added to the system so just see even if you are adding the basic pollutants or we are adding the acidic pollutants in both the cases the carbonic system is capable of taking care of both nature of pollutant and that is why even if the large number of pollutants are added more or less the river system is still pure but it doesn't mean that we should keep on adding the pollutants right let's talk about something the light we have discussed about two abiotic things that is uh, we discuss about uh, the air and we have discussed about little bit about the water as well now let's discuss the another abiotic factor that is light now we know very well sun is the ultimate source of light right now what is light in the eyes of physics light is a visible spectrum that is having a certain wavelength okay that wavelength varies from uh, that is the visible range we know very well that uh, 390 nanometer to 680 nanometer that is what we call visible range of light but beyond that there is also some electromagnetic radiation and that radiation can be visualized in the form of uv rays that is ultraviolet rays having a wavelength less than 319 what we call uv rays and some in which the wavelength is more than 700 what we call infrared rays okay if you talk about first of all the uv radiations again you see there are three categories of uv radiation what we call uv a uv b and uv c now all these radiations are categorized on the basis of the difference wavelength for instance if you talk about uv c their wavelength ranges from that is uh, 180 nanometer to 280 nanometer okay similarly for uvb the range is from 280 nanometer to 320 nanometer and for uva the range from 320 to 390 nanometer that is the range now what is the significance of all these uv rays primarily we know very well that uv ray is a dangerous that is a mutagen for human and why it is mutagens because the moment uv ray enter into our body this radiation is going to cause a mutation by the formation of a thymine dimer 
okay and that the excessive formation of thymine dimer often manifest itself in the form of one disease what we call zero derma pigmentation and that is what the skin cancer right but at the same time what happens uv ray also promotes bacterial photosynthesis but there are uv rays that is going to kill the bacteria as well that we, what we call as a bactericide you might have seen that in your house there is a ro system in case of ro system there is a uv ray now what is the function of that uv ray the uv ray is given to the water and as a result whatever the bacteria that is present in the water with the help of that uv ray actually it is killed it is a uvc that actually act as a bactericide you might have seen this the radiation of the uv rays in the hospital as well have you ever visited the icu ward of any hospital though i wish that you should not but if you visit you will find that there is a blue light hanging from the roof that blue light actually emits the uv c the very purpose of putting that light in the hospital or particularly in case of icu ward is to naturally kill the bacteria okay so the uvc is a bactericide if you talk about the visible range of light that is starting from uh, the violet to red so they are the photosynthetic active radiation what we call par right and that radiation is primarily utilized for the photosynthetic activities okay and finally there is a ir way that is a infrared way right in case of infrared also there are certain cases in which the photosynthetic activities do occur okay now let's talk about the effect of light on any aquatic system let's take an example of a lake well by the way let me ask one question what is the difference between lake and pond can you tell me what is the difference and please don't tell me that pond is a small lake is big that is the answer which is given by class 8 student of course lake is big and pond is small but what is the major differences in terms of the distribution of the phytoplankton you know if you talk about the ponds in case of ponds they have a rooted vegetation all along the ground starting from the side wall and all along the ground they have a rooted vegetation but can you find the rooted vegetation in case of lake answer is no so we distinguish pond on the basis of the presence of rooted vegetation at the bottom that is at the benthic region now what is the reason the reason is very simple of course the reason lies from the very fact that lake is a big and pond is a small and since lake is a big there is a greater hydrostatic pressure and due to that hydrostatic pressure what happens that the rooted vegetation at the center of lake is not possible but in case of pond since hydrostatic pressure is not to that an extent so that's why rooted vegetation is found all along the surface so that is the difference between the pond and lake and i would like to draw your attention towards the screen in the screen shore of a lake is shown now there are clearly three zones in case of lake is identified and what are they they are littoral zone lemanitic zone and profoundal zone now what is the littoral zone littoral zone are those zone which is associated which is in continuation with the terrestrial area and that is characterized by the presence of rooted vegetation you can see in the diagram wherever the rooted vegetation is present what we call it is a littoral zone now what is the lemanitic zone the lemanitic zone is a dead zone of aquatic system up to which the penetration of the sunlight is going to happen okay the point where the penetration is going to happen for the sunlight this is what we call lemanitic zone and what is profoundal zone profoundal zone is the bottom zone where what we see that the light do not penetrates now let's talk about the the species that is living in the uh, the aquatic system and we can divide them primarily into two group what we call 
plankton and nekton. Now, what is plankton? Plankton are those microorganisms which floats. So they have a poorly developed locomotory organ. Okay, so this is what we call plankton. So the plankton can be phytoplankton, it can be zooplankton. They mostly present at the upper area, what we call surface area. Now there is second is what we call nekton. Now what is nekton? Nekton are again small size animals. And in case of nekton, what we see that the locomotory organs are well developed. Then we call it as a nekton. In case of profounder zone, we have already discussed. It is a dark zone in which the light fails to penetrate. And as a result, species which is dependent upon the material that is falling from upper region to lower region, right? So all those species like snails and slow moving animals that is actually found in the profounder zone. Okay, and this is followed by a series in which we are discussing the different abiotic factors in which we have discussed about the atmosphere, the water, and in case of water, we have discussed about the different zones in case of the lakes, right? That's all for today. Thank you.